So we're gonna, I'm gonna chat with all of you first um, about some important information. And then we're gonna go into this fun and easy cooking demo that you can follow along you know, with me from, from home. And I'm also very excited to get to each of your personal questions at the end. And I love that um, we've left enough, enough time for that. So Thriving Through Food is a really great title for this talk because you know, I think what I hear from a lot of my clients is that the whole topic of nutrition and wellness for cancer it can be really overwhelming and stressful. You're probably hearing lots of different information from very well-intentioned people, but it's very confusing and overwhelming. So my goal today is to actually break through that frustration, confusion, and give you a place to take action immediately in a positive way and to move forward. Um, and so I want to start off so that we can all remember or actually even learn for the first time that the word nutrition, the root word, actually comes from the same root word as nurture. And that resonates with all of us because the very first thing a mother gives to her child after skin to skin contact is food. Food is coming from a place of love and nurturing. And so we want to really keep that in mind, even when we're dealing with something like nutrition for cancer survivorship, and the stakes are very high, and we want to get it right. But if we approach it from a positive place of nourishment, it's just going to go so much better. So that's where we're going to start from today. And so we're going to cover topics like eating for immunity, we're going to talk about plant based diets, and not just fruits and veggies, but herbs and spices. We're gonna sort of give a shout out to how thriving through food involves other parts of wellness. So sleep, stress management, physical activity, these are all interconnected things that you can tap into for support and for healing. So I think one place to really begin is I wanted to talk about just a couple symptoms that you might be experiencing if you're in treatment, if you've recently been in treatment, if you're in longer term treatment for your cancer, there can be some lingering side effects that make the whole fun part of nutrition and immunity not so much fun. So I wanna start there. So a couple things that people often ask about when it comes to appetite, chemotherapy and other types of treatments for cancer can have an impact on our motivation, desire to eat, really that appetite. Right. So there are things that can kind of help you tap into your appetite if it's a little off. So how do you know if you're hungry? Sometimes grazing and doing small, frequent meals is helpful. Sometimes if you're snacking all the time, you don't know when you're hungry. So there's not a one size fits all. It's actually important to experiment and kind of see what feels better in your body. Think about things like texture right? We, we often think about flavor, um, but we do, forget about texture. So if you're experiencing, let's say, dry mouth, then things that are dry are not going to taste as good to you because they won't be as comfortable. So look for smoother, softer textures, or maybe smoother, soft textures feel funny in your mouth. You like that crunch. So think about texture when it comes to meals. We're going to talk about digestion in a second, but constipation is a real challenge with many types of treatment. And if you're constipated, so I'm a nutritionist, we talk about lots of fun things like bowel movements, gas, bloating, all the things you don't normally want to talk about in public. Um, but you know, really though, when if you're constipated and everyone can relate to this, you're backed up. You don't have an appetite. You don't want to put more food in. So sometimes the way of helping your appetite is actually to address the constipation. And then serving a safe food, you know, oftentimes during treatment, your tastes change. And so some things work great. Other things feel unknown and kind of make you feel a little insecure about that meal. You don't want to take the risk. So if you're going to try a new food, always have a safe food with it so that you know you've got like a go-to. And so in terms of healthy digestion, and we'll spend more time on this in the Q&A if people have questions, um, but fiber is a big topic. So looking for uh, prebiotic fiber, 
soluble fiber foods. And we're gonna learn about some of those in our demo. Um, but things like whole grains, uh, beans, nuts, seeds, fruits and vegetables, these may help you support healthy digestion naturally. Also hydration, right? Your hydration needs are up a little bit when you're going through treatment. Um, and as we get into summer, as you get more active, um, and if plain water isn't appealing, that's fine. You can take like 100% juice, do a splash to flavor, put in some like frozen or fresh berries or some fresh mint, um, soup, fruits, popsicles, anything liquid at room temperature counts towards your hydration as long as it's free of alcohol and caffeine. Um, and then movement. When we move our body, like walking, stretching, yoga, exercise, that helps move the muscles of our digestive tract as well. So movement is a key way of helping to combat fatigue and sluggish digestion. Okay, so that was our little chat about symptom management. And now I wanna kind of get into it about all the things that you wanna know about. Um, so let's start by talking about plant-based diets. So eating more plant-based foods is correlated with supporting our immune system, reducing inflammation, and promoting cancer survivorship. There are other benefits of getting more plant-based foods as well. So when we think about detox, it isn't like what you read online about cleanses and detoxes that sound either magical or frightening, depending on who you ask. Um, your body knows how to take care of itself. Our job is to give it the fuel that it needs and kind of get out of the way. So certain kinds of vegetables that we're gonna talk more about in a second can actually help our liver to naturally turn on more enzymes involved in our detoxification processes. They can also help give us the fiber that we need for gut health. And gut health is key for immunity. They also have a lot of cancer fighting properties. So there's the whole family. You see the little broccoli stalk there for a reason. Um, we'll get more into those veggies in a second, but they help us with cleanup. Pigment, so very bright. That's why you hear eat the rainbow. Vibrantly colored fruits and vegetables are packed with natural compounds that are safe and effective at supporting our immune system and reducing inflammation. So blue and purple, they're called anthocyanins. So that's what makes a blueberry blue or eggplant purple or blackberry, kind of that blackish purple color. Those are also good for our heart. They're great to include. Vitamin C, we know that's important for our immune system, but it comes from more than just an orange. Kiwis, bell peppers, cauliflower, these are just a few examples of vitamin C rich foods besides oranges. We're gonna, I have a whole nother slide that picks apart the different kinds of plant-based diets. But the short message is that you can follow a plant-based diet at many levels. You don't have to necessarily be vegan to be a plant-based eater. There are many options for you. And lastly, we're going to see in our cooking demo that healthy fats can really benefit our body. Choosing the right type of fat can help you shift that inflammation balance to be more anti-inflammatory and less promoting of inflammation, right? So foods like avocado and salmon, nuts and seeds. So don't feel like you have to write this down, although you're welcome to take a screenshot. This is being recorded. I'm happy to share my slides out to you. But this is just a fun chart to kind of spark a conversation around colorful fruits and veggies. So you can like use this as a guide when you feel stuck on like, oh, I know she said to eat the rainbow, but I eat the same things every day. You can come back to this and look at some ideas that you might want to check out in a different color family. Um, so it's not a complete list, but I tried to think of as many fruits and vegetables as possible. And I bet there's something in here that you've never tried and you might actually find that you love. Okay, I mentioned that we're gonna do a spotlight on cruciferous vegetables. So here we have some fun cruciferous veggies here. We see Brussels sprouts, we see cabbage. Bonus points if you can guess the one on the right. Um, it's really pointy and sharp, um, but it's really delicious. So 
this family of veggies actually comes in all colors because cauliflower would fall into this family as well, even radishes. So this one is not color-based. Cruciferous vegetables have sulfur containing compounds. That's why they're gassy. Um, that really help support our immune system, can actually balance out estrogen in the body and have a number of cancer fighting benefits. And when we look at research specific to breast cancer and specific to metastatic breast cancer, um, you know, all fruits and vegetables are really important, but the cruciferous family tends to kind of rise to the top as really having some benefits. So we can get creative with how we eat these. You can certainly shave a Brussels sprout and put it in your salad. You can chop up some broccoli, but you can absolutely use your air fryer or roast these in the oven. If you're having some digestive upset, then you might wanna cook them a lot more than if you weren't. So just because a veggie is you know, talked about as being healthy, keep in mind that there's like, probably 50 ways you could consume those vegetables. And there's always a way that's going to work for you personally. And it's not just kale, even though kale is in this family. Okay. So here's a nice long, long list of cruciferous vegetables that you can think about including in your life. Um, the other hero family in terms of our rainbow that I want to mention when we think about breast cancer and research are those carotenoid rich veggies and fruits, but mostly veggies. So what I mean specifically, they're orange. So very common in the fall, but actually available through you know, much of the year. So foods like sweet potatoes, carrots, uh, pumpkin, all the winter squash, like butternut squash, spaghetti squash, acorn squash. So as I'm talking, if there was like a little voice in your head that started saying something like, oh, those have too much sugar, hold that thought. We're going to talk about sugar in just a minute, but I'll cut to the chase and tell you that they, they really don't. They are full of immune supportive, anti-inflammatory compounds, healthy kinds of fiber that have been studied and shown to be beneficial for women who've already been diagnosed with breast cancer in terms of supporting overall health and wellness. So we wanna quiet those uh, unfounded naysayers um, that kind of come from rampant internet information availability. Um, okay, so I'd love for you to take away from this uh, conversation today some action steps. And we'll continue to talk about those, but I'm gonna give you a few right now. And you don't have to do all of these tonight or tomorrow, but these are some things that we can start to think about and take action on pretty much immediately. So number one, when we talk about the dose of fruits and vegetables to support health and wellness. Okay, I'm gonna ask you, you can put this in the chat. Um, how many Americans, so what percentage of Americans or how many out of 10 do you think eat the recommended five servings a day? So you can give me a percent, you can give me like a this number out of 10, but what is your best guess for uh, American adults? How many of us are getting the recommended number of servings on a daily basis? Okay, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna peek and see what some of the answers are here. Okay, wow. Okay, awesome. Of course, I'm not surprised. We have a really, really smart group here. Um, and yes, you are all correct. The ones who are answering these very uh, low numbers. Um, unfortunately, that is true. The good news is that we have a lot of room for improvement and we can all start right now. But everybody who said 10% or one out of every 10 is correct. So only one out of every 10 American adults is eating five or more servings of fruits and vegetables a day, which tells us that it is a little more challenging than it sounds like, but we can take action on that. So specifically two fruits and three or more veggies a day is the dose that we wanna go for when we think about how many fruits versus how many veggies. So. The other nice thing is that, you know, back in the day, we always focused on serving sizes, like how much counts as a serving. 
Now we don't need to even go there because really you just need to eat them. So you don't need to have a scale. You don't need to measure things. You just want to like check the box that it is represented. So you can look at your breakfast bowl. You can look at your lunch plate, your dinner plate. Do I have a fruit? Do I have a vegetable? Check, check, check. Yes. Don't get caught up in how much is enough. What's a perfect amount. It will all kind of work itself out. Right. So, you know, some helpful things to tell you though, is that frozen fruits and vegetables are a wonderful option. They are just as good as fresh when something is out of season because they're frozen right away and those nutrients are locked in. They will also be cheaper and they don't perish as easily. So if you're tired or you're just busy and you don't get around to making everything, you can just go to your freezer. Um, for things like a banana, half a banana counts as a serving. So like little bits really add up. Berries are a great choice because they do tend to be lower in sugar and really, really potent in terms of those antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds. When it comes to veggies, three or more a day is what is suggested. And so you could think of it as one being a cruciferous member, like we talked about, and then two others. So if you ate a salad, you would easily have three veggies potentially in that salad. Or if you're making a soup or you're having a bowl, you can easily layer these things in. We're gonna talk about sugar in just a minute. And we're gonna also focus on some healthy fats in a little bit more detail. But when we think about fats, I will say a couple things. So um, in terms of breast cancer specifically, the research does continue to support a lower fat diet as being preferential when we look at outcomes. Now that doesn't mean processed fake foods that are like fat free, um, but it does mean that you might want to avoid a very high fat, low carb eating plan like keto. And we can talk about that, uh, the trendy diets in a little bit. Um, but within sort of a reasonable amount of fat in your diet, it's more about choosing the ones that are gonna be anti-inflammatory and rich in those immune supportive nutrients. So something called healthy fats. So that would be like your plant-based fats and fish. And those are the types that we wanna choose when we're having them. But for this group, we just don't wanna go overboard um, with the amounts. Now, one fun thing I wanted to mention because we're in April, and um, even if you live in a, a colder climate, like I do outside of uh, Boston in the New England area, you can still have a garden. You can even have a year round garden inside, right? Like in a little herb garden, but local produce that you might get at like a farmer's market or certainly in your own garden is really amazing. Not only are you supporting like sustainability and the earth and local farmers, when we eat local produce, it helps support our microbiome or our healthy gut bacteria the most compared to just fruits and vegetables in general. So the more you can find and emphasize local produce, the better. So if you wanted to have any level of garden in your home or outside um, in your yard, gardening is also a wonderful form of exercise and something that can be very helpful in terms of stress management. But I just listed here, and I'm not going to read these all off to you, um, kind of starter for some ideas of things that you could play around with planting. And, you know, it's like amazing when people have a really good green thumb and they can, you know, grow something from seed. Um, but you can also get those starter plants and, you know, you don't have to grow it from seed for it to count as being part of your garden. So I would encourage you to think about some kind of a plant so that you could grow. Um, it could even be an aloe plant. Those are really easy to support, um, you know, keeping them uh, healthy and, and going. So what about shopping tips? Um, I mentioned about the frozen produce, um, plant-based. So one challenge you can think about in the weeks ahead, and you could even start this tomorrow if you would like, is one main meal a week. So like one dinner or like one whole day out of your week to be 100% plant-based. 
So can you have a meatless dinner like and celebrate something like meatless Mondays as a way of building into a plant-based diet? So that's a challenge and a question and not a requirement, um, just something for you to think about maybe trying out. Um, meal prep, that is something that can be really helpful. And if you have loved ones helping you with meal prep, they really like having direction. So if you have directive notes on flavors, on textures, even if it's just a no list, like no more desserts or yes, all the desserts, whatever it is that you feel your body needs, um, even sharing that information. But as much as we're able to do a little bit of meal prep, like over the weekend, it doesn't have to be elaborate. It can help you manage your energy during the week and really ensure that you're hitting those goals for healthy eating. And the recipe that we're going to do together is a great one for meal prep. Now, I want to mention a couple new things in research that you may or may not have heard about that I think would be helpful for this group just to be aware of. Again, keep in mind when you hear about studies, you hear research on nutrition and cancer, um, we need to keep it in the big picture. Big picture tells us that sleeping, being physically active, eating fruits and vegetables, managing stress, that's the cornerstone that's really important. Like limiting red meat, limiting processed meats, great. Then we get into these nitpicky fun studies but none of this information is more important than that larger eating pattern that I just described. Um, but one of these interesting things, and this is very preliminary, okay? Um, but high salt intake might be something that you wanna think about adjusting. Now, again, everyone's different. So listen, if you're in the middle of uh, a really aggressive treatment regimen right now, and your salt levels may actually be dropping low, then this doesn't apply to you. But if you're eating a regular diet, your sodium levels are fine, then yeah, we kind of want to think about making sure we're not overdoing it on salt because typically Americans are eating like three to six times the amount of sodium that is recommended for us. And we know that a lower sodium diet is very important for heart health and heart health is very important for anyone who's been diagnosed with breast cancer. So excess salt can promote inflammation in the body. So when you're buying a packaged food, look to see how much sodium is in there. So I gave this example here of canned tomatoes. Tomatoes are super healthy. Canned tomatoes are fine. Boxed tomatoes are fine. There is an overwhelming amount of difference in the salt if we just read the label. So it's really hard to read the fine print. Um, so I, I made the the number's bigger for you. Um, but the one on the bottom, on the front, it just says low sodium, no salt added. There's only 15 milligrams of salt in this canned tomato product. The one on top, there's 200 milligrams. So there's just a big difference that you can easily cut down on um, pretty simply, right? And so look on packages. And then when you're cooking, look to use herbs and spices over salt because you're going to get more immune supportive nutrients. Now, what about sugar? I know everyone has questions, so I'm going to just touch on this now and get into it more in the Q&A. Um, but there are two types of sugar for you to be aware of. Natural sugar, which is natural, let's say, in fruit. Added sugar is sugar that we're like adding into foods, either in manufacturing or when you're cooking at home. There's a big difference about how these work in our body. Natural foods Foods with natural sugars, sorry. <laughs> Foods with natural sugar, okay, like fruit, give us a lot of benefits we just heard about. Fiber, important vitamins, electrolytes, and plant-based nutrients that support our immune system and reduce inflammation. We need and want to be eating these foods, and we want about two servings a day. We don't need eight servings a day. We want about two, and that is a very healthy amount from a sugar perspective. Now the place to cut down on sugar are what we call added sugars, and they are sneaky. There are sneaky sources of sugar in our food. If you were to go right now into your pantry and into your fridge, I promise you, you're gonna find savory foods where sugar has no business being and there's sugar in there, added sugar. So the place to cut down on sweets isn't necessarily 
you know, uh, celebration, like your birthday. If you want to enjoy a piece of cake on your birthday as a dietitian, I'm telling you, you should. But on a day-to-day basis, if your salad dressing, if your sauces, if your marinades, if your soups, if your protein bars have a lot of added sugar, we can cut that out. So you get to enjoy that piece of cake without going overboard on added sugars. It's the sneaky ones that we want to ditch, not the celebration ones. These are all names of sugar that could appear in the ingredient list on the food label. So don't feel like you have to memorize this list. Um, As I mentioned, I'm sharing all this to you, Um, but you can see that it is not as easy as you would think to identify these sneaky culprits. It's getting easier as companies are required to use this new food label where you can see I've highlighted in red a line for added sugar. So if you're buying yogurt, if you're buying a marinade or a sauce, if you're buying a a protein bar that has fruit in it, the sugars that come from the fruits, those are okay. Um, But we want to limit the added sugar. So that's what you want to look at on the food label. And the recommendation from a heart disease perspective for women is under 25 grams of added sugar per day. And for men, it's under 36. A can of regular soda has 40. So it adds up really quickly. Now, if you, you know, had 40 one day, one moment in time, no big deal. But if you're having 40 every day or twice a day in an ongoing manner, we might want to kind of take a look at that and start to adjust it. So I'm not going to, I already talked about all of these suggestions, but this is um, a graphic that you can, you know, look at on your own um, to see. So I want to briefly, um, in the next couple minutes before we start our demo, just mention a few more studies specifically looking at nutrition um, for women dealing with breast cancer. And so this was a very small study in Italy looking at intake from food um, and where there were deficiencies, where people were hitting the mark or maybe going beyond. And I only mention this as more of a kind of a self-awareness and really to say, if you have any concerns about am I getting enough nutrients in my diet to support my body during treatment, um, we can take a closer look at that. And that is something that dietitians love to do and love to help you with. Um, But in this small study, uh, the women in Italy during chemo, they had a drastically reduced intake of foods rich in vitamin B12, Um, B5, um, which is another important vitamin for energy, had a healthy intake before treatment, but then during and after it dropped. Um, Other B vitamins like um, thiamine and niacin, riboflavin, like one, two, and three, um, some of them were getting mega doses of these. Same thing uh, with vitamin C, not really a toxic level, but those were really being consumed a lot. Um, Same thing with vitamin A, We all know vitamin D, many of us struggle with getting a sufficient amount. The point here is that, you know, we want to look at the details and understand that if your appetite is reduced, if you're experiencing side effects from treatment, you may not be getting enough of certain nutrients that you need for energy, for metabolism, for immunity. And so again, if you have concerns, we want to take a closer look as an individual. What about supplements? And we're gonna get more into this in just a minute. Um, but I wanted to mention this study. And again, this, is, this was just published um, last year where about a thousand patients, so it's not a huge study, um, but these women were on these uh, chemo agents here. So doxorubicin, cyclophosphamide, and paslitaxel. Um, and the study was looking at women, what supplements were they using and what were some outcomes? And again, this is only a thousand people but it's a good way of thinking about some things in general. So number one, the use of any antioxidant supplement. So super important, foods are foods, supplements are different. So eating blueberries, wonderful. Eating an orange for vitamin C, fantastic. You are not going to overdose yourself on antioxidants from food. Supplements are a whole nother story. Okay, so this is not about, hey, don't eat as much kale. This is all about what supplements are you taking and when 
and making sure you're involving your team, including your dietitian, in that conversation. So any antioxidant supplements, either before chemo or during, were correlated with an increased risk for recurrence. And we know that antioxidant supplements in high doses during certain types of treatment, not just certain chemos, but like radiation, can hinder the effectiveness of those treatments. This is not new information, but we're continuing to look at it and study it. And so I listed a few examples of antioxidant supplements. Women who are using vitamin B12 and iron either before or during also were correlated with poorer outcomes. Now, again, if you have a diagnosed iron deficiency or B12 deficiency, that might be a different scenario. Sometimes people just want to hedge their bets and think, oh, well, I could be anemic, so I'm just going to take iron or B12. But there are many kinds of anemia. So if you're worried about whether or not you should take iron, your doctor can do a series of blood tests to check specifically for iron. You can be anemic for reasons outside of iron deficiency. So again, the point here is that personalized nutrition, personalized medicine. Multivitamins, we're fine. So if you're taking a multi with approximately around 100% or less of the daily value, that is safe and honestly probably helpful um, for many things. So I'm not going to get into these all these little words here. Um, turmeric and curcumin. So turmeric is great. It is an antioxidant. So don't take it as a supplement if you're on certain kinds of drugs. However, using turmeric in food is wonderful. It is not only an antioxidant, it is very potent anti-inflammatory, and it is very helpful for our immune system. So we don't need turmeric in everything. You know, turmeric is like the new kale, um, but it's a wonderful spice to cook with. You can add it to lots of dishes, lots of savory meals, and a little bit goes a long way. Put a pinch of black pepper, and that helps your body keep the turmeric active and effective for longer. Otherwise, we break it down really quickly, and it, it doesn't stay as potent. Selenium is another one, um, and I only have like one other I want to mention, and then we'll get into cooking. Um, but selenium, you may have heard more about this hero mineral recently. I've heard a lot about it in the news. I've had clients asking me all about it. But selenium is a mineral that we need for immunity and metabolism, thyroid health, energy. There are lots of functions throughout our body. But we don't really eat a lot of selenium-rich foods necessarily on a regular basis. And the amount in our food depends on the amount in the soil. So from food, again, it's an antioxidant. So don't go taking it as a supplement just because you heard me start saying it's a healthy nutrient. Go for food first. So these are Brazil nuts in the picture. And if you eat three to five Brazil nuts a day, that is like the dose to get the right amount of selenium to support all those things I just talked about. And they're yummy. You can buy a whole bag of just Brazil nuts. You can order them online. You can get them at the grocery store. You can just eat them. You can put them in your salad or your oatmeal or whatever. Um, they're great. Um, I like to do this, you know, as many days as I can remember. Um, and also whole grains, um, seafood, eggs. There are other foods that are rich in selenium as well. Um, lastly, I want to mention zinc. Now, you've probably heard a lot about some of these nutrients because of COVID and the pandemic, right? So um, there's been a lot of research and study looking at immune supportive nutrients to help us through the pandemic. These are important for anyone dealing with cancer as well. And again, we don't necessarily need to take a zinc supplement, but zinc is associated with taste and smell. So if you are having a difficulty tasting food during treatment, then again, on a personal level, you can investigate with your dietitian and your doctor if taking a zinc supplement might actually help you with the smell and the taste issue. Um, but we can get zinc from a lot of foods. So seafood, again, is a wonderful source, baked beans, pumpkin seeds, chickpeas, cashews. So look to include zinc in your diet on a regular basis. Um, for anyone on Instagram, I'll show you my handle in a minute. I've been trying to make a bunch of little videos um, to kind of highlight some of these things. So um, feel free to watch those. Um, but quickly, one of the, um, again, very preliminary studies looking specifically at metastatic breast cancer 
has been looking at the benefits of a Mediterranean style diet. We already know this type of eating is so healthy for our heart. So, and for our brain, right? So that's using olive oil, fish and nuts and seeds, limited red meats, um, lots of fruits and vegetables um, as part of that diet. And specifically, these phytochemicals might have special benefits. So allicin is one of the um, hero phytonutrients in garlic. And when you smash your garlic, you you take your knife and you push down, um, it do that at the beginning of your cooking process, because when the air hits the exposed garlic, it makes the allicin more potent, it potentiates. So that's a cool trick. Um, Astragalus, which I'm now seeing I spelled wrong on here, um, that's an herb and it's mostly in teas and supplements. So again, you gotta like look at your personal um, situation. And then hesperidin is cool. It's a phytochemical that is in the peel. So if you like to use the zest of a lemon, a lime or an orange, you can get extra phytochemicals that are helpful for your immune system just by zesting that into your food. So as I mentioned, you can follow a plant-based diet on the spectrum of plant-based eating. All plants, some plants, sometimes plants. And we've talked through each of these examples. Don't worry if you eat a plant-based diet that you're not gonna get enough nutrients because you will. You can get protein, you can get omega-3s, as I mentioned, zinc, calcium, B12, iron. All of these are available to you from plant foods and from healthy animal foods too. So you have options for your nutrients. They don't have to come from meat. So if you want to eat more plants, how do you get started? Well, you can layer, meaning that if you're making turkey meatballs, you could put frozen spinach, you could put cauliflower rice in there, you could put tomatoes in there, you could put pumpkin in there. So you could layer some plants into something that wouldn't normally be all plant-based. That's one example. You could do the meatless Monday thing or any day of the week and kind of swap it out. Um, You could pick lunch, you could pick breakfast. So you can kind of start with just layering in some plants. You don't have to give up things necessarily. It's way more fun to add things in than it is to give things up. So feel free to brainstorm with each other. Um, You guys can do this really quickly and write into the chat. What are some easy recipes where you like to put more plants into them? So like for me, when I make risotto, which was like something, I don't know why I never learned to make it before, but that was like a quarantine thing. I started making risotto a lot, Um, but I put cauliflower rice. um, I kind of dilute the rice with the cauliflower rice, not because I'm trying to reduce the carbs that we're all eating. I want to boost the amount of veggies my kids are eating um, and that my husband and I are eating, right? So it's from a positive mindset, um, but it really is amazing and nobody knows or cares and it's awesome. So go ahead and type in the chat some of your favorite things. Um, Fitness, we're not gonna really get into today other than to say, do it. So 150 minutes a week of anything, walking, yoga, tai chi, stretching, hit training, whatever you wanna do is the dose to help promote uh, survivorship and support your immune system. So you can spread it out, You can do it a couple days a week um, and it can also help with symptom management. We're gonna come, we're gonna make that in a second. I just wanna let everybody know, um, I recently opened a Facebook group, so it's free. You're welcome to join uh, Cancer Nutrition and Wellness and we're growing. Um, So feel free, we do challenges. It's just a great place to connect and share recipes um, and chat about all the things like we're talking about today. I'm going to be launching my 90 day signature program called nourish. And this is a 90 day program where we're going to do live weekly video sessions. And there's tons of content so that everyone going through the program gets to experience personalized nutrition and fitness in a group setting and in a very uh, affordable manner that is highly effective. So anyone who's interested in that, you can reach out to me. And I do want to make sure to be available. So whether you message me on social media, my Instagram handles here, you're welcome to email me, you're welcome to go to my website. Um, I just love this organization and helping. And so any way you want to keep in touch with me, I would always love to hear from you. All right. So before we get into questions, we're going to do something fun. We are going to make this recipe right now. Um, So I know a lot of you have the ingredients ready to go. Um, 
I'm going to get mine ready to go right now. And I am just going to make this uh, here so that you can see me. I'm going to slide all my stuff over and I am just going to uh, move my, uh, my uh, television set here to my filming studio <laughs> so that you can, okay, you can't see me. There we go. All right. Hopefully we can see me and the counter enough. You know, I got to tell you the hardest part about all of this is this part right here. Okay. So hopefully you can see me and on the screen, I've got the recipe. So hopefully everyone's gathered up their ingredients here. And okay. So this is, I, I made this right before this in like five minutes. So this is only going to take us a couple of minutes, but we're making these chocolate chia energy bites and you can sub around the ingredients to your liking, but this is a really great way to get a high energy snack or even a breakfast. Okay, so we don't have a lot of ingredients here, just a few. So you're gonna, you need a bowl and we're just gonna dump stuff in the bowl and mix it, it's so easy. So you're gonna start with a half a cup of rolled oats. Now oats I mentioned are part of that family of prebiotic fiber. So prebiotic fibers feed the healthy bacteria that already live in our gut. A probiotic is introducing new bacteria to your body. A prebiotic feeds the bacteria you already have. And prebiotic fibers are really helpful um, for gut health and for um, helping to promote regularity and for immunity. Okay, we can all see. Okay, so into the bowl goes my half a cup of oats. You can do rolled oats, steel cut oats, up to you. Next, we're gonna do almond butter. Now almond butter, you could sub peanut butter, cashew butter, sunflower seed butter, any nut butter is gonna work great. And you're gonna add about a quarter cup of that right in. Now nut butter, specifically almond butter is rich in vitamin E. So that's an antioxidant, which you don't wanna take as a supplement during treatment, but you can eat it to get the benefits. There's protein, there's fiber. We're gonna do about two tablespoons of maple syrup and you're gonna put that right in here. And maple syrup is a sugar, but it is a natural, healthier type of sugar. Again, we don't wanna have you know the whole jar, but using a little bit in a recipe is a great way to add stickiness and just a hint of sweetness along with some B vitamins. I'm gonna use a little bit of a chocolate protein powder Mine is uh, plant-based. You can use whatever kind of protein powder you would like, but this is gonna boost the protein content, maybe boost the fiber and some micronutrients, okay? Um, can everybody see me okay? I see me. Yes, okay, great, awesome. Okay, so chocolate protein powder goes in. Cinnamon, this I don't measure because I love it, but you could like measure um, out like a tablespoon or two but cinnamon adds a great flavor and can actually help balance our blood sugar. I'm gonna add in my chia seeds and you can do white, you can do the dark ones and those are gonna go right into here as well. I've got some dark chocolate chips. That makes it really lovely and delicious. A little bit goes a long way. Those are gonna go in as well. I've got everything in my bowl. And so I'm gonna just, I'm gonna stir this up and it is so easy. If it's too dry, add a little more maple syrup. If it's too wet, put a little more oats or a little more protein powder, you can customize it. So as you mix it, you're gonna be able to kind of squeeze it. It's like a batter, like a cookie batter. And you're gonna form it into a circle. I have another bowl of chia seeds and I'm gonna drop this in and shake it up and I'm gonna cover it in chia seeds and they're gonna come out like this. And so it's a little energy bite and I quickly made a whole bunch so fast. And now you can put them in the fridge. Um, they stay really good in the fridge for a long time, but these are delicious. I'm gonna eat it and then I'm gonna have chia seeds all in my teeth, but or more of that. It's so good. It's really sweet, but it's not a lot of sugar. It's a ton of protein and fiber. And this is great if you are not um, really hungry and you want to get a lot of nutrients in. Okay. Did everybody make those? I talk fast. I move fast, but you're mixing, rolling, shaking, eating. The best part is the end. Okay. 
So that's the cooking demo. And um, I hope you all enjoy that. And now I'm going to um, ask Jean to help me with the Q&A. Okay. Thank you, Stacy. So we do have 53 questions and counting, but let's just awesome. get the questions taken care of about the recipe. So I'm just going to ask them quickly. What can you say? Uh, if you don't like maple syrup, what's a good substitute? And can you explain, can you use quick oats? Are rolled oats or steel cut oats different? Great question. Okay. So instead of maple syrup, I think honey, um, especially like a more like wildflower or like a local honey, if you have that would be great. Molasses is like a wonderful sweetener. It's very high in magnesium which many of us are low in and actually treatment can deplete your magnesium levels a bit too. So uh, molasses would be wonderful. You could do a play on this with like uh, molasses and ginger, you know, either with the cinnamon or instead of the cinnamon. And that'd be nice, like, or do like an all spice or nutmeg, do like a kind of a winter warmer version. Um, and then on the oats, I personally find the rolled oats work best but you could certainly use instant oats if you had those at home. You could use steel cut oats, it would just be chewier. You really could use any of them um, and you can kind of experiment. It's more of a texture thing with which you prefer. Okay, great. So while we're talking about seeds, I know some people like chia seeds, some people like flax seeds. So I have recently learned that I have not been uh, storing my flax correctly. Um, and it seems like you really need to grind the flax in order to be able to absorb it. So can you help people understand if they use these products, how to use them so they're the most effective? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay. So, and this is another point I didn't even mention yet. So for fats, um, it's better to keep them in the refrigerator. They'll stay potent longer. So I actually keep my chia seeds and my flax seeds. I keep my peanut butter and almond butter, my cashews. I keep those in the refrigerator once I open them. Um, so that's another tip you can use. You could swap the chia seeds if you don't like them. You could use flax seeds. Um, I would do the ground flax seed for mixing into it because for flax seeds, we don't break down the shell very well in our digestive system. So to, they're all high in omega-3 fats. So chia, flax, and hemp seeds are good sources of fiber, protein, and omega-3 fats. Chia and hemp, we can get to the omega-3 without grinding them, but the flax, we cannot. That shell is very protective. So to get the omega-3, you need ground flax seed. And ground flax seed would work very well in this recipe. If you wanted, you could do the ground flax on the outside, or if you wanted to have that seedy texture, you know, like a sesame seed bagel kind of thing, you would just keep the flax whole for the outside and still get the benefit of the fiber from it. Um, hemp seeds would be another option if you're not a fan of chia or flax that would share similar nutrients and work really well um, in the same recipe. Okay, so I know when you go to buy these things, it's sometimes confusing. So if you can't find ground flax, do you grind it in the coffee grinder? Yeah. Do you put it in a Cuisinart? Like what, what, how do you do it? Yeah, you can put it in your blender, your food processor, your coffee grinder. Yes, any and all of the above. It works great. I even make breadcrumbs now. This is like another pandemic thing. Like I started saving the ends of the bread and then I like, I feel like my grandmother It's awesome. And then I like put them into my uh, blender or food processor with like herbs and spices. And I was like, oh my gosh, now I'm not wasting this. I have all these breadcrumbs. So anyway, there's all kinds of stuff you can do in those machines. Okay, great. That's helpful. So you talked about constipation, which I think was helpful, but you didn't talk a lot about diarrhea. So I've, there's a bunch of questions about that. Um, so yeah. can you, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So a couple things. Um, I think the, the things I don't want to forget to mention would be depending on the type of treatment you're on, the strategies probably are different. And what I mean by that is for people who are on immunotherapy, you do not want to take probiotics. So often when we have diarrhea, people are like, Oh, go take a probiotic. It is not advised with immunotherapy. There's some early research to 
suggesting that taking probiotics could reduce the effectiveness of the immunotherapy. So don't do that. Prebiotics, this is so confusing. This is why you need a dietitian. Prebiotics are wonderful and are not contraindicated. So there are products on the market. One I particularly like is called Sun Fiber um, that are prebiotic fibers. So it's like a modern day version of like Metamucil or Benefiber, like a thousand million times better that someone experiencing constipation or diarrhea might find helpful um, that generally is safe. Um, but just like with any fiber supplement, you want to separate it by an hour from any medicine or other supplement. Ask your doctor, don't just start, you know, ordering stuff off Amazon, like talk to your nutritionist, talk to your doctor. But um, I would suggest that the other thing for diarrhea would be um, to have smaller, more frequent meals. You need foods with carbs, potatoes, rice, pasta, bread, please like turn down the internet ridiculousness about those foods being bad for you. There are times when they are actually very important and helpful, right? So if you are suffering from side effects, malnutrition is worse for your immune system than eating a baked potato. So it's like kind of keeping that context and that perspective um, and trying to limit if you're having diarrhea, um, spicy food, fried food, extreme temperatures, like super hot or super cold, um, those can also be difficult. So, um, you know, definitely getting help on that is great. But those are things, um, you know, I'm also happy to share more details about because I've got like lists and lists and lists of good ideas beyond what we just said. Okay. So just staying on gut health for a minute. What about lectins? Mm, great question. Um, so, okay. So sometimes people are dealing with uh, gas and bloating and maybe you also have constipation. Maybe you also have diarrhea. Maybe you just have gas and bloating. So there are different reasons for gas and bloating. So you could become temporarily lactose intolerant, which is common. Um, and that could contribute to gas and bloating. Um, you know, lectins are uh, essentially a component of foods like beans and certain nuts and seeds that sometimes can contribute to gas, if, especially if you're already gassy or you have some kind of a gut issue going on. And so it doesn't mean you have to give those foods up necessarily, but you might want to manipulate them. So you might find that canned beans, um, and particularly brands like Eden's Organic, or others that use a type of seaweed, when they cook the bean can break down the lectin content. If you buy canned beans, rinsing them helps remove the lectins, smashing them and getting that outside shell off helps to remove the lectins. And then cooking is another strategy. Um, the stuff online about lectins and immunity, I don't find to be scientifically accurate necessarily or evidence-based, um, but certainly gassier foods like that may contribute to more gas or bloating in someone who's already struggling with it, right? And, and so that's a good example when maybe not everyone should be eating plant-based all the time. So when I work with people who have sensitivities to lectins, we work on having clean animal proteins to help, you know, balance that out. So that's where, you know, this personalized plan becomes really important um, so that we're, you know, not trying to do like a one size fits all for everyone. Got it. Um, there's some questions about collagen, um, yeah. plant-based or not. I feel like this is another, the new kale as well. So tell us what it is, is plant-based better and is it safe if you're in treatment? That was a great question. Um, I don't really think it's been around long enough to uh, study collagen specifically with treatment, but I, I don't think it would really be an issue because so collagen is just a component essentially like a protein component that is in animal foods. Um, like as a, as a nutritionist, when I hear things like plant-based collagen, it's like, how does that even, what is that? 
Like, uh, so I'm not, I'm confused by the idea of a plant-based collagen. I don't know how natural it is um, because that's like, doesn't work like that. Um, but we need collagen. Think about your skin, right? Yeah. So like what we makes our, yeah. I know, I know, especially as we get older, we need more. Um, so um, that's why eating foods rich in like vitamin C can help having those healthy proteins. Um, but there's a ton of collagen powders on the market. Yeah. They are fine to use. They might be helpful for your skin. Um, they might even be helpful for your gut, but they're not a complete protein. So what that means is that if you want a protein powder to help meet your protein goal, collagen is not going to be sufficient. You'd probably want to use a traditional like protein powder and the collagen because the collagen is really more targeted for like skin health um, than it is as a full, it doesn't have all the amino acid building blocks that you need for protein to function for your immune system, for your blood counts, for your muscle, for your metabolism, right? Um, but certainly using collagen is great. I mean, I'm all for it. Okay. And is whey powder a complete protein? A pro yes. Okay. Yeah. So whey, whey protein, whey is, there's two main proteins in dairy. We always learn in college, whey is way better. Um, <laughs> so whey, whey is the one that people tend to digest easier, which is why it's kind of isolated in certain protein powders. Casein, you know, like curds and whey. So casein is the other protein in dairy. And sometimes when people have a dairy sensitivity, it's the casein or the lactose that they don't do as well with. Um, so whey protein is a complete protein. It's easy to digest. If you're including dairy in your diet, you could use a organic, clean whey protein powder. Great. You can also look for a plant-based protein powder. If you don't want to have dairy, you don't want to do whey. Um, and not all plant-based protein powders are complete. Uh, the best way to know if it is is when you look on the food label, it says like grams of protein, and then there's a column with the percent daily value. The percent daily value is often missing when it's not complete. The company doesn't wanna declare it because it's mm. gonna be so low. So that's like a hack to find out um, if it's complete or not. Um, but protein powders can help if you don't have a good appetite, right? You can make a smoothie, you can put protein powder in your oatmeal, um, you could even, if it's unflavored, you can uh, dissolve it in warm water and use it in a soup. Um, you could even do something like bone broth as a way of like multitasking your goals and getting hydration, electrolytes, and some protein. Um, so there are lots of options out there, which I know can be good, but that can also feel overwhelming. Um, so feel free to ask. Okay. So another overwhelming question. We have someone who is, has celiac, so can't have any gluten yeah. and is overwhelmed with the number of other kinds of flowers that are out there and what, which flowers would be the best to, to use? Yeah. So with uh, celiac, you need to be gluten-free. It is extremely important. And so having a gluten sensitivity is not the same as having celiac. So when you have celiac, you have to be careful for cross-contamination. Um, and so the most important thing in choosing any food product when you have celiac is that it is certified gluten-free. So that absolutely has to be on the label. So oats do not technically have gluten, but many oats share the same machinery in processing with wheat in our country. So if you have celiac, your oatmeal needs to say certified gluten-free. So that's probably the easiest way to know. Um, you can also look on the allergen statement in bold on the back. It would say contains wheat or made in the same facility as wheat. And so someone with celiac would obviously avoid those. But things like quinoa is gluten-free, buckwheat, which has the word wheat in it, so that's so confusing, is gluten-free. They call it kasha in uh, Eastern Europe. Um, teff is a gluten-free flour. Um, there are a lot of, there are a lot of options. Um, there's almond flowers, coconut flour, there are all kinds of other flowers. Um, they're blended flowers that mimic all purpose flour. But I think the easiest way is to look for that certification um, on the food package. Can you make your own flour with almonds? Oh yeah. You yeah, just so grind you, it up. Right. Yeah. So that's a yeah. way you can feel very safe. Okay. 
Or so, like oat flour. You could take your gluten-free oats, pop it in your blender, and now you have oat flour. And it's like half the price. You know it's gluten-free. Yeah, that's a great idea. Right, great. So what in terms of using food to manage side effects, we have a question about someone who has neuropathy, and I'm sure mm-hmm. there's many women that experience that. Are there foods that could be helpful? So in general, so like neuropathy is like numbness and tingling, and it, it, it has to do with inflammation to some extent. So in general, that more plant-based, fruit and vegetable rich, healthy fat, you know, everything that we've talked about today on a kind of, you know, macro level, global level could help to reduce some of the intensity simply because you're reducing the burden of inflammation in your body in general. Um, Having said that, you know, that's not necessarily going to cut it when you're dealing with this on a long-term basis. You got to do more. Um, So for some people, including anti-inflammatories like uh, omega-3 or fish oil, again, ask your doctor, ask your dietitian. Um, But that might be something that could help. Um, There's even like alpha lipoic acid is another type of a healthy fat that comes as a supplement that's been shown to help diabetic neuropathy that some people with cancer um, are able to try. Vitamin B6 is something that you could try. Uh, Typically 50 milligrams, definitely not more than 100. But again, check with your team. B12, there's been a lot of new research that certain um, treatment regimens, you should not be taking higher doses of vitamin B12. Um, so I, that is something that's a blood test. So I think before you took B12 for neuropathy, you might want to get a blood test and see if you're deficient before just taking a supplement. Um, some people find Reiki therapy helpful, acupuncture, Tai Chi, yoga, there are some other things that can help uh, neuropathy as well. That's a t- it's definitely a tough one. Okay. And then we always address uh, two topics we always address. One is soy for those yeah. that have estrogen sensitive uh, cancer, and then also organic, non-organic. But this time we also have a question. If you buy local produce, do you have to worry about pesticides? So oh, take those oh, in question. any order you want. <laughs> okay. So I'll, and I'll, and you'll, you'll help me because I, I may not yeah, remember. Yeah, I'll remember. Okay. I haven't written down. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so, so soy. Okay. So there's like a chasm. There's like a Grand Canyon between natural soy foods and processed soy like supplements and products. So natural soy foods, meaning like edamame, miso soup, tofu, tempeh, those are not associated with a risk of developing breast cancer or a risk of uh, recurrence, progression, or negative outcomes in women diagnosed with breast cancer, including an estrogen positive breast cancer. There's been extensive research, gosh, since like the mid 2000s, looking at this exact question in people, in women who are going through breast cancer. So if you want to have, you know, tofu in your quinoa bowl, if you want to put edamame in your pasta, that's all great, healthy, safe, and fine. What we don't know enough about still is processed soy. So if you're eating a veggie burger, uh, like a fake sausage, a protein powder, a bar that says isolated soy protein, soy protein isolate, textured vegetable protein, some long words with soy in there somewhere, those are much more concentrated in the estrogenic components and we just don't have any data. So it's really hard to know. So generally I would say do like ripple, like pea protein milk or do oat milk or almond, you know, like do something that's gonna be um, something we know about or pick a protein powder that's not soy or pick a bar that's not soy. You have so many options now. I think the processed soy we wanna try to limit because we don't know. The natural soy, if you already eat it and like it, you may continue. If you don't like it, you don't eat it, you don't have to. Um, So that's kind of the soy thing. Um, And things like soy sauce don't have any estrogen at all. So you don't have to worry about that kind. Um, so then we'll organic. go to organic and local. local produce. Yeah. Okay. So local is definitely the best. So if you have a farmer's market, if you have a CSA, it's great. 
And a lot of small farms cannot afford the organic stamp of approval. It's very expensive and very difficult to get. So you can ask those people. You're either at the farmer's market, you can message them or call them if you're ordering a CSA, and they can tell you all about their farming practices. And most small local farms are not using a lot of toxic pesticides, right? They also are trying to protect the environment, support their local farm. Um, so you don't really have to be super concerned with that. The other thing is that the data showing the benefits of eating five or more servings of fruits and vegetables is clear. It is so much better to eat fruits and vegetables, whether they're organic or not, than it is to avoid them because they're not organic. You're going to do more of a disservice by avoiding fruits and vegetables than you will be helping yourself by like only having organic, right? So it's just hard. You know, if we had more transparent systems, you know, it's just really hard to kind of know, which is why local really does tend to be best. There's a lot of pushback right now against things like the dirty dozen list um, as not being evidence-based, um, that they haven't proven that there is really an advantage to that. And that's true. You know, when you look at research, it's do people eat fruits and vegetables? Yes or no. That's really the thing that seems to be most correlated with promoting health than whether or not it's organic. Now, if you have access to organic, you like organic better, you want it great. Um, but we don't want to be um, avoiding fruits and vegetables because they're not necessarily organic. But you want to wash everything. You want to pay attention for like recalls. Um, you know, you want to be smart about like food safety. Um, so I don't know if that fully, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, I think that's that good. When it. you say wash your vegetables, because I've noticed in it, at the supermarket now, there's all these vegetable wash products. Like, is water good enough? And, or do you need to be doing something else? No, water, according to the EPA, water gets like 90% of pesticide residue off running water. So like, take your broccoli, stick it in the colander and run the water and like move it all around. If you want to go above and beyond, get a spray bottle and put in um, like some vinegar, and lemon and like water and, you know, maybe baking soda. And you can, you know, use those kind of natural things to, you know, further clean your produce if you would like to. Um, and then to keep it from going bad, because like if you wash, first of all, like wash it when you're gonna eat it, that's one thing. Cause otherwise it gets like gross in the refrigerator. Um, and if you're doing something like lettuces, put like a paper towel back in the container to help absorb some of the extra water so it doesn't get like wilted um, and soggy, you know, from, from washing it. Yeah, um, I, have, I have memories of my mom having paper towels yeah. with that, but now we all get this triple washed yeah. spring mix. And I certainly notice it goes bad, but um, I want to add, we're really running out of time, but I want to ask you this question. Um, what what if like you like vegetables more than fruit? Can you trade off that percentage or does it have to be the same amount of servings of each? Oh, no, that's a great question. No, I mean, hey, if you're more into veggies, go for it. I mean, I think it's more about eating the rainbow. So it can be fruits or vegetables. I will say berries, and there are so many kinds of berries. There are things from other parts. There's like acai or currants. You know, they're berries from all over the world. Um, so berries are a pretty great family, but you don't have to eat them if you don't want to. You could certainly do five or more servings of veggies if that's your jam. That's super healthy. Just go for like diversity in color, seasonality. But yeah, I mean, I, I love that. That's great. And actually, a lot of our vegetables are they're not they're fruit. So like, anything with the seed is technically a fruit. So a cucumber is really a fruit, a zucchini is a fruit, a tomato is a fruit. So I think we're all doing good as long as we're getting either of those categories. Okay, we have one minute left. But there's so many questions right now in the in the chat about turmeric. I, I know you said this, but I think you need to reiterate that supplements are not the way to go. Really, you should be eating the turmeric. Yes, I think the yes. So in order to take it as a supplement, you would first before you hit purchase now, you would need to take a picture of the exact label and talk to your doc, your on not like your like your oncologist and or your like oncology nurse practitioner, your oncology dietitian, you'd want to say, this is what I want to take. 
Yes or no, you guys tell me, right? And so that's super, super important. There might be people listening who are out of treatment, not taking any medications. And so, yeah, you know, you, you might be in a group where you could think about a supplement, um, but anyone on meds, anyone in treatment, you got to get the okay first. Um, but, you know, honestly, it's very safe and very effective from food. Um, and it's not part of American culture. So in Asia, they're using like a couple of tablespoons of turmeric in cooking a day. That is like way more than anyone here would really tolerate. So go small, get like a quarter teaspoon. Um, it's yellow. It's what makes curry yellow. It's like if mustard wasn't spicy. It's not spicy. It tastes kind of earthy, um, but it's yellow. So if you want your rice to be yellow, cool. Um, you might put it in eggs like an omelet because it's already yellow or in I made like a pasta sauce with like butternut squash. So I put a little turmeric in there. Um, so go ahead and play around with cooking. That is your best way to go. And a pinch of black pepper is enough to make the turmeric more potent for you and safe from food. So only do the supplement if you get your, you know, physician's blessing but everybody could be eating at least a little bit of it. Um, and it's good. You get in the habit of it. It's, it just keep a little bit out and shake it on stuff.